everybody. It is the Board Game Mechanics, and it's October. And we have an extra spooky episode for you. With, with me, the Spinning Jenny, Joel, and with me, as always, is is old water. I don't know, water real water. I don't remember what it's called. Water frame. Water frame, man. Old old water frame Smith over there. <laughs> hey guys, what's going on? Jason, aka Water Frame today. Water. That's a good nickname for you, Water Frame. And spinning Jenny's not as good for me, probably, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but still funny. <laughs> yeah, I guess it was actually my my nickname in middle school, so that that hurts a little. <laughs> yeah, opening up those old wounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, for for the one person out there who's looked at arc rate rules at all and knew what we were talking about, good on you. Good on you. Yeah, it is what it is. That just gives them... They can Google it and find it out if they didn't know. I'm going to tell you something, man. I uh, I picked that one up on a sale. Got a pretty good price on it. And it was like on my radar before just because it looked, looked cool. Like running a factory seems cool. That game has very little to do with running a factory and more <laughs> about like being a terrible person and like, putting other people out of business. Yeah. But it looks awesome and I really want to play it. So As do I. For sure. All right, so... Yeah, up in this top section, we got scolded for not answering all the questions. Yes. Well, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> I I couldn't find these two questions at all. At all. I can't either. Yeah. So I told Mr. Ochoa that we would talk about them. So we'll go ahead and answer these real quick, and then we'll move on to some news. So which are your favorite board games as apps, either by fun or by best implementation and experience? Uh, who? You know what? Just because my wife will play it, Ticket to Ride. I really like that app. Oh yeah, that, that is a good one. Twilight Struggle because that's the only way I get to play it. That's another one too. Yeah, I've been playing um, Police Precinct. I really like that app. Yeah. Yeah, I, li- I like the board game a lot, but the app is just—I don't have to set it up. I can just click on it and go, and then just shut my phone off whenever I'm done. So Police Precinct is probably mine. It, well, and then I really like uh, Paperback. That's a really good little app, too. And it's actually, I think, free or darn near free. Right. Yeah, I haven't played that one, but it would be good. All right. And which digital games, card slash board, would make good physical games? Uh, hmm. Obviously, Fortnite. And Fortnite Dances would be great as a board game. <laughs> Don't we already have that with like Warhammer and every other miniatures game? Yeah, I was I was being very clever there, Jason. <laughs> That's what I figured. All right. Um, I was going to say Candy Crush, but Simon's putting out that new game about that looks just like Candy Crush. So never mind to that. And they already have Potion Explosion. That's They're really true. milking that Marble Tower thing, yeah, aren't they? They are for sure. Yeah, I don't I don't play a ton of digital games, so I don't have a good answer for it. But well, uh, I really really loved. Dead by Daylight. I played that game quite a bit on the computer over the summer when I had like free time. And that's an asymmetrical, like I'm killing everyone kind of game and you can like bail each other out. So it's like a one versus all. But I don't know, man. I think usually digital games are digital games because they work better that way. And there's really too many pieces usually involved to get a really great game going. Um, as far as the universe in the digital world, I think would make a cool board game. Um, I don't know. Maybe the maybe the uh, Resident Evil or the Silent Hill would make a cool like horror type game. Um, I'll say there's a game called Factorio that would be a really cool Euro game. Um, but yeah, uh, you got me started on digital games, and that's like another thing that I'm I'm pretty into. <laughs> yeah, I have nothing, so I'll agree with you. Whatever you say. Okay, Factorio, it is. <laughs> oh, and also. Um, I heard from some people who listen to the podcast, they don't quite get our humor all the time. So I just want to make clear that my being rich and famous was tongue in cheek. I, that's not my actual goals for the podcast. I mean, it would be nice if that happened, but right now I just want to break over 200 likes. So I thought people would pick up on the, <laughs> the, the tongue in cheekedness of that. But just to be clear, I know we're not going to be the next Tommy V. I get that, but it was just entertaining entertaining banter to be honest with you i was like man jason really wants money this week like <laughs> what's that about like maybe he's getting tired of doing all this for free i don't know <laughs> well, well katie said 
I'm your wife and I didn't understand that you were joking. So maybe you should clarify. I'm like, all right, I got it. <laughs> so that's a little clarification there. All right. So bring it around full circle. Jason jokes about wanting to be rich and famous <laughs> off the podcast. Well, I don't say anything because it's my true desire. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> You guys could take that as serious or sarcasm, whatever you would like. Yep. Laid it on pretty thick there. Hope, <laughs> hopefully you figured that one out, guys. <laughs> no, it was awesome to get some feedback this week. We got some really great feedback on some Facebook pages where we were spamming our stuff. Jason was spamming our stuff as, as usual. And we actually got people that said, hey, I've heard this podcast. It's not terrible. Um, I think <laughs> yeah. someone yelled at me stomach for, it is what yeah. someone said. Yeah. So that was pretty great. Yeah. Someone yelled at me for saying it was mediocre, which was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. You guys, if you're hearing us and you're one of those Facebook people, man, that like seriously made my day. Uh, but you know what? If you're listening to this podcast, good on you too. I think we were making your day because you're, you're on board with us in this early crew, man. So uh, when you make one of these references to the password or something else that we did that was stupid back when we had less than, you know, a few thousand listeners or something, <laughs> we'll have a special place in my heart for sure. So yeah, yeah, you guys are here early. That's awesome. I agree. Yeah, that's and that's about all the introductory talk I have, Jason. I took a special workshop on doing transitions on podcasts online on elearning.com <laughs> forward slash podcast transitions. Um so this is all, this has been a nice, uh, I didn't pass. I don't know if you could tell. <laughs> I have a magical uh, edit button that I can fix it in. All right. So let's get into some news. There's some interesting stuff on, on Kickstarter and around board game news this week. So I'll get started with one that I've been wanting to play for a while that is getting a second edition, and that is Belfort. TMG is doing a second edition. It's going to have all the expansions, including the Hard to Find expansion expansion, and a few other, I think, new modules. And I think all in, like the base game and all the expansions, it's $75 on Kickstarter. And it just dropped Tuesday, so August or October 2nd. So if you're interested in that, go check it out. I, uh, I give this one a fully endorsed It's Fine rating. <laughs> Yeah, you told me that, and it kind of disheartened me a little bit because I've been really wanting to play this game. I think it looks cool. It's it's uh, it really is fine. It's kind of cool. The best part about it is that the okay the board sucks because it's these pizza pie slices you got to stick together and they never stay together very well. Right. Yeah. Um. So maybe they fix that in this edition. I doubt it because I don't know how they would. But um, then there's these guild cards you put out, and that makes the gameplay a little different every time. So I do kind of like that. Um. But I mean. I don't know. It's it's pretty light, I think, Jason. And I honestly, I think I got rid of it when I played Lords of Waterdeep and thought, hey, this is a slightly more streamlined city building kind of game. So with worker placement. So I don't know. I mean, uh, Belfort's definitely a little more silly, a little more fun game. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, it's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with the game at all, but I I chose to back something different this week. Well, maybe that the second edition is coming out. I can find the first edition on BGG somewhere or something. I might get to play it someday. We'll see. Yeah, it's it's fine. All right. The next piece of news I have is in regards to our boy, Stefan Feld. And it was announced today, October 2nd, that Renegade is reprinting Trajan. And that will be releasing in December. And it looks like a pretty straight reprint. I mean, the box was white instead of black. But outside of that, all the pieces look identical from what I saw in the pictures. Yeah, I mean, Renegade Games um, do really good production of things. So I think the production on it won't go down, certainly. And this is one that people really like. Um, I think I played this one maybe five, six years ago and wasn't totally wowed by it. But I think it's, again, a perfectly fine game. So pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I already have it, so it's kind of irrelevant to me, but some people who have been wanting to find it that can't now probably will be able to, so that's exciting. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's the only pieces that I have, so if you have some interesting things that you'd like to talk about, now is your time. Uh, I have some interesting things I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> so Keyflow, uh, I it looks kind of cool. Um, I only mention that because I really like Keyflower, um, but Keyflow is on Kickstarter right now. And this is one that you can you can get. It's a little pricey. Um, I think it's forty pounds or around fifty two dollars to get this guy. 
Um, but it seems like a pretty cool, fairly crunchy game. Uh, kind of like a card laying kind of set collection sort of thing going on, it looks like. Um, so pretty neat. Um, all the games in that key series, I think, are certainly rock solid. So um, that's one that's out there I think is worth checking out. And then the one that I'm really excited about, and I actually made a secret special video. So if you're not on our Facebook page, you missed out on this. Uh, this is this is why we've been telling you, we've been telling all you guys to get over to our Facebook page. So you missed out on this one if if you didn't get over there. Um, unfortunately, I mean it's a hard lesson that you had to learn somehow. But <laughs> you need to go over and follow the, follow the board game boys over <laughs> on uh, on on the the Facebook, but. Uh, there's there's a game on there. Uh, if, what a, if you're listening to this early on Friday, it might still be there. It's called um, Homebrewers, and it is my number six game on the worker placement list, which we're going to revisit this episode, was Brewcrafters. And this one looks like it's uh, got some similarities, but it's like a spiritual sequel or successor to, to Brewcrafters, I think. Um, it's taken some of the newer, hotter mechanisms in board games that we've seen had come out in the last, you know, three years and, and kind of tried to implement those. It looks honestly to me, I mean, it utilizes dice really well. It seems like, and it's got like kind of cool tracks that you're kind of trying to score up on. So it's, uh, it's kind of like just a neat looking game with some set collection, drafting kind of action selection, kind of cool stuff. So really cheap. That's why I thought it was pretty neat. It's 35 bucks. So I was actually going there to get tiny Epic Max, um, or tiny. Yeah. Tiny Epic max right yeah yeah um and and uh i was like man this is only nine bucks more and it looks like a full box of a game so uh tiny epic max still looks good and it definitely funded but I, i'm rooting for the underdog on this one it hasn't quite funded yet we'll see if it makes it or not yeah i, I saw this one on kickstarter and i was like man this seems like joel's game <laughs> it feels a lot like brew crafters and then i watched another review and said oh yeah this is the sequel to brew crafters and i was like oh well that's why it looks like it and feels like it I love I love beer games. I think we're gonna just find that I love beer games. That's I mean I don't <laughs> yeah. like beer all that much, but I, I love beer games. So um, yeah. So anyway, if you if you got on this one in time, awesome. You're in the the cool guy crowd with your cool guy Joel. Um, I'm the furthest thing from a cool guy. So please don't imitate me and try and be cool by being like me. Like honestly, my wife will tell you that that's probably the worst life choice anyone can make. So. <laughs> Uh, and that was it for news. Now we're looking f forward to <laughs> our best transition yet. All right. So I got the chance to play a few games this weekend. I didn't really play a ton, but I did play some stuff that I wanted to talk about. And the first game that I want to talk about is called Xi'an. It's from Surf and Meeple. And it is a game about building and painting terracotta warriors. So it's essentially like a card-driven action selection game where you're going to draw four cards, and you're going to use two cards for each round of the turn. So there's six rounds, so you take two actions each each round. So you're going to use two cards. One of the cards is going to be how quickly you're going to do the action, either number one through six, one being the slowest, six being the fastest. And then the second card is going to be the actual action that you get to take. So you're going to take the action, then you get to go a little worker placement spot, on the board to either paint a terracotta warrior, build one, move up on this in-game goal track, or get some equipment cards to do some set collection. It's a really fun game. It is really punishing and tight. You make one wrong move, you're probably going to lose. So that's my kind of game. And another reason why I really like it is I actually got to beat Katie at a game finally. So that is Xi'an from Surf and Meeple, A++ from Jason. Yeah, Beating your wife probably feels good. And I mean, like, that sounded bad, but I think we all know what I meant there. <laughs> yeah. Not beating my wife, but beating my wife. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw some Terracotta Warriors. I don't know this game very well, but I did see Terracotta Warriors when I far traveled to the far reaches of Indianapolis, Indiana, when I went to the Children's Museum there. They had some. So, um that, I guess that was just a bonus for you there to have. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much that relates to the game, but there are little plastic terracotta warriors in the game. <laughs> and Gen Con's in Indy. Yeah, that's true. Conspiracy theory, man. <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. I guess. <laughs> uh, all right. So, I, man, people are never going to believe I wasn't drunk for this episode. Um, <laughs> the game I played was Heaven and Ale. 
<laughs> you do love beer games. <laughs> I just finished Brew Crafters. Uh, and so I was like, hey, what's next? Heaven and Ale. Um, Heaven and Ale is a really cool game. And it looks really beautiful. The art does on it. And then I would look at the back and I'd be like, this looks dumb. It's like an oval with a bunch of hexes on it. And then like, I lay these abstracted weird hexes on a board and... Like, I don't even get it. It looks dry and dumb and themeless. And it is dry and themeless, but it's not dumb. It's really awesome. So, I mean, the game, it works with brewing beer, I guess, is the theme on it. But Sort of, yeah, sort of. It's just a cool game, man. Like, how you're trying to move things up a track and just kind of activate them. The only rule I didn't understand going into it that I thought was different was the turn order I always thought was determined by the player in last place. And I guess it's really just still goes in clockwise, but you just, you go until you did the whole lap. So I don't know. There's some advantages to like one of the guys would, that I played with would jump out. Like basically you, you move on this track and you can never go backwards. And wherever you go on the track, you take one of the hexes from there and then you place it on your personal board and you pay different amounts for it. Or you can cash in, do some actions to get some money. Money is super tight in this game. It feels like almost all the time. Um, but at any rate, um, it was a really cool game, really fun. And so um, one of the guys would jump way ahead on this track and just be way out in front of us and get kind of pick of what he wanted from the second half while we were all kind of fighting over the first half of the board. And then he would come in like a turn quicker than us. So he lost like maybe a turn every time, but he got really good selections, which I thought was kind of clever. Um, it just It's a really interesting game. It's one of those games that I really want to play more because I think there's just so many different ways to play it and just wrap your head around it. Um, and then just all kinds of crazy victory, like point ways to get victory points. Um, like you have these little bonus cards that you can get, these little barrels you can pick up that give you extra VPs. And then the way how the actual score is figured where you have this little brewmaster that's like working up the track, but then all your ingredients have to average out with like a ratio kind of thing. And just, uh, it's really neat how it all works out. It's the thing that I think is the best about it is I can't think of another game I've played. That's like it. It's just everything in that game feels new to me. Um, it doesn't feel like anything else I've really played. So that's why I think it's pretty cool for sure. Um, and like, I think you said, you know, it's really, really possible that you could end up with negative points in this game. Yep. And I could definitely see that, but the guys who I was playing with like knew what the heck they were doing. And the one guy scored like 65 points. I was like, are you kidding me? And I scored like 22. So, um, it's just a (laughs) tough, tight game. Yeah, I played with people who played once before. So I think the last time I played, we had like 30 or 40 points. But man, getting 60, that's nuts. Yeah, they had everything maxed out at 20 and then had their brewer up to like the times three. And then they had like another few points. So I think they scored like 68 points or something like that even, which is crazy. That is crazy. Yeah, they were good at it for sure. (laughs) Better than me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> and probably most people because that's crazy well the the problem i had is there's two halves on the board one half pays out in money the other half pays out in ingredients and i focused i think too much on money and then i was kind of like wasteful with my money and then the other piece too is like the way how you can place your uh like patches of land that you're getting water or grain or hops or whatever from like i didn't quite it didn't quite click in my mind that i wanted to place monks in spots where they could trigger twice by being in the right spot between the two like ranches or whatever, or whatever they call them, the settlements. And then, and then, uh, so I would put some really dumb things in spots where they would trigger twice, you know, but I don't know, really neat. Just a bunch of cool mechanisms in that game. Yep. I agree. It is a a really good game. Um, the next game I played is from Renegade and it's been out for a while. I think maybe came out last year or the year before. I don't, I don't really know, but it's called castles of Caladale. We were playing this, my buddy came over and his wife, and we were playing this game as a little filler until Katie got back from doing something with our daughter, and this is the most AP game I've ever played in my entire life for a little tiny filler. So you're drafting tiles, and you're putting these tiles into your castle. The The trick is, all throughout the game, you can manipulate your castle in any shape that you want. As long as like, t- like types of castle structure like wood or brick or tree or whatever is connecting so you either take a tile and commit it to your castle or you take a tile flip it face down and just take a point for it and then by the end of the game you get one last turn one last like chance to rearrange your castle to score maximum points and i seriously like 
This game, I've never had AP this bad in my life. I, it took me like 10 minutes to draft a tile in one turn because I couldn't figure out ways to manipulate the tiles to get that tile to fit in there. It's just too free form, and you know how I feel about the free form games. I can't do it, so it needed some more restriction for me. But outside of that, it's a fun little game. Just expect some AP and the game to go probably twice as long as it should. So if the tiles were tetraominoes or pentominoes or whatever they call them, Tetris pieces, this would be a game that you and your wife would like become angry at, which would be kind of fun. So, oh yeah, oh yeah, I I actually think with those tiles though it would be easier because with the squares tiles <laughs> yeah. it was t- it was tough. I mean, it seriously was tough. Like I felt like I was about to flip the table. It was that tough when I was trying to draft these stupid little pieces. It's a fun game though. It just it made me feel like a complete moron. Do you think you would be less AP prone the second time you played it? Like, did you figure something out or is it just the nature of the game? It's just, whoa. Well, I think part of it's the nature of the game because the fact that you can always move it around just opens you up for a ton of AP because, oh, well, this combination over here is better. So then you move something around and then it messes other stuff up. But I also think I'd probably keep less of the tiles that I draft. Next time, I'd only keep ones that I knew would fit and I would just create my my castle as I go and I wouldn't manipulate it. So if it couldn't fit the way that it was at the beginning, I would, I would just take the tile and flip it. I think that's where I got into trouble. That's cool. Yeah. It's a, it's a good game for sure. Just, just a little long and AP. I'm calling an audible here because I just, I'll tell you why later you're, you're going to have to listen for another five minutes to know why the audible happened. Um, have I talked about majesty for the realm? I think you did, but I don't know. Um, Okay, that's one that I played this weekend. <laughs> what else did I play? Um, Downforce. I'm going to talk about Downforce. Have I talked about that one? Yeah, I have. Because you were like, sounds like it's better than that dumb horse game you love. <laughs> yeah, I did say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I'm good talking about games I played. I played a ton of stuff, but it's just, I get to play stuff that I wanted to play. So I played Brass, and I played Downforce, and I played Welcome To, and just a bunch of stuff that I really do like. So um, I don't know if I've talked about Gizmos yet or not. I did play that one, too. That one's awesome. It's a great engine builder. Um, I don't know, man. You guys, let's just get right to the good. I think I've been looking forward to talking about these these games coming up. We're going to talk a ton about games here that we love. So right. let's just let's just skip me, I because I had a game here, but I'm we'll talk about it later. Yeah, and I played some games that are going to show up later too. So I didn't want to mention those, but yeah, I'm with you. You just thought about it before we were actually rolling live tape, which <laughs> because you're a very good planning boy. <laughs> No, I've made some audibles before, too. I don't normally do it, but I have before. All right. And that was games that we played with a very good transition out of it. So, okay, guys, like, you don't get our humor. I get that. But kind of a little joke is that we don't know how to transition between (laughs) segments. Yeah, so we don't. We just stop, and then the bumper takes over. (laughs) And, like, sometimes the bumper music starts playing mid... All right, so we asked you guys to pick a topic, and you did. You picked lots of topics, but we picked the winner, and we've already notified the winner. And if I was better prepared, I would know what the winner's name is, and we could talk about it. So let me see if I can find it. I'll keep rambling for a second. James James. Livermore. James. Yeah. Uh, I got it. James Livermont. Yes. Livermont. There you James go. Livermont. You picked the topic, and the topic is top five worker placement games. So... The reason kind of why we picked this is because last time we had technical difficulties, we did numbers 10 through 6 worker placement games. So we figured, hey, what better than to do top five? So to give you a little overview of what we talked about on the last one, I'll go ahead and say what our numbers 10 through 6 were, and then we can jump into the top five. Before you jump into that, I would think it's probably safe to say that if we we did this like, I don't know, like before Origins... Right, this list, yeah. and so I'm guessing our <laughs> list may not be 100 percent accurate, but at one point in our lives, these were our top ten worker placement games. Right, um, and, and, and still I modified good games. my top five. I modified my top five to make it more accurate, but also James Livermore. Um, you didn't win. It was James Livermont. I'm sorry that I got you excited there for a second, but <laughs> James Livermore, if you contact me via Facebook <laughs> Messenger, I will make sure that you get a promo for um, my. <laughs> unnamed, undesigned prototype that I'm working on. Yep. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, all right. So a recap, numbers 10 through 6. So we'll get started. So number 10 for me was Champions of Midgard. 
And number 10 for Joel was Orléans. My number nine was Euphoria. Joel's number nine was Caverna. My number eight was Orléans. And Joel's number eight was Shakespeare. My number seven was Kanban. Probably would be higher now, but that's neither here nor there. And Joel's number seven was Champions of Midgard. My number six was Viticulture. And Joel hanging out with the beer game was Beer Crafters. Hic- hiccup. <laughs> All right, so let's dive into our number five through number one. Before you get started, Jason, can I just mention to those who just listened to you how disdainful you were towards Caverna? You're like, Joel's number nine was Caverna. (laughs) I I didn't realize I did that, but maybe I did. I I exaggerated, but you can tell you're a little disgusted I picked that one. (laughs) Yeah, it should have have been Agricola. This has dwarfs in it. It's not a Euro. What are you doing? (laughs) This is a Meritrash. Uh, yeah. The I expansion might fix it, Jason. It might get better with that new expansion. That's true. Let me, let me re-say it. How about number nine for Joel is Caverna. How about that? Is that better? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> very, very hot take there. <laughs> All right. So now moving on from that, I'll go into my number five. Jason, Jason obviously had a pass in one of those 900 number dial-a-boy <laughs> things back when he was younger. Yeah. I tried to talk about that. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to fund this thing. You could just call me at home. It's like six bucks a minute, but I'll talk to you about whatever. <laughs> yeah. Six bucks a minute. That's a steal, man. Hey, man, I don't know how to fix your car. I, whatever. <laughs> Ride a bus. <laughs> Did you try Googling it? <laughs> oh, speaking of that, this is a completely off topic a little bit, but I think it's Jason, funny. no. We're very serious, Jason. <laughs> don't do that. So my daughter brought home this homework. And she had to write something in rainbow writing. Have you ever heard of that? No. Yeah, me neither. So guess what I did? I YouTubed it and I found out what, what rainbow writing is. It is yeah. taking a crayon. You mark, you write the letter. Then you go over the top of it with another crayon. Then you go over top of it with another crayon. So it looks like a rainbow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, completely irrelevant. But since we were talking <laughs> about Googling things, I just used the YouTubes as my uh, my handy dandy tool today. And it was fun. So I guess really we all that to say our next podcast is going to be our top 10 favorite games that utilize rainbow writing as a mechanism within them. Heck yeah. All day. I don't know of any yet, but <laughs> I'm sure we could find it. It's coming. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. So back to uh, worker placement games. Um, my number five, which I just actually put in here recently because when last time we did the list, I hadn't played it. And I just played it a couple days ago again, and that is Dinosaur Island by Pandasaurus. This game is absolutely incredible. Every single time I play it, I like it more and more. Um, I have the expansion coming. That's going to add some water dinosaurs and some fancy deluxe tokens because right now I have the retail version. And essentially, all this is you're gonna you're going. It's like five different mini games in one. So you're going through. You're placing some workers to collect some DNA dice to upgrade your cold storage so you can store more DNA. Then you're placing workers in your lab to create dinosaurs, to upgrade your security so um, patrons don't get eaten, to upgrade paddocks so you can store more dinosaurs. And then guests are coming to your park, and they're either going to score your points or money, or they're going to get eaten by dinosaurs. And you're going to do that over probably six or seven rounds until a certain number of goals are completed, and then the game's over, and whoever has the most points is the winner. It's super simple to play. It's easy to teach, but it looks like it's a beast. So some people kind of get turned off by it just because it takes up such a table space and is huge. But it's an easy game packaged as a Vitale sort of game. It's so good. Um, And like there's a lot to that game. But I almost argue the opposite that you look at it and you're like, oh, what's this cool licensed property game that probably came from a big box store based on the graphic design stuff. But then you like get it all laid out on the table and you're like, um, uh, yeah, Jason, help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's really good. It's really good. And I'm like, I don't know if you guys can hear my teeth gritting or not, but I am just anxiously waiting for my copy to get here. I'm with you. I'm in the group of, of, uh, guys who are waiting for their copy to get here from Kickstarter. So anyway, uh, yeah, great pick Jason. My number five, Jason, is uh. Oh, hey, I've got an update here. Uh, 
Looks like we're looking at November for Dinosaur Island to come in. Um, just thought I would mention that to everybody. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Dinosaur Island Watch, brought to you by the Board Game Mechanics. Uh, now back to your regularly scheduled podcast. Uh, all right. My number five, J- I don't know who that guy was that jumped on there. Um, my number five is Voyages of Marco Polo, which is a game that despite the appearances of that box um, and despite in spite of not despite in spite of um, all the recommendations I got for this game much earlier than, than uh, when I actually played it, this game was actually fairly new to me, but man, is it good? It's such a good game and I haven't played it with the expansion yet. So it might even be higher than this, but every time I play this game, I don't expect to be like, Oh, my stocks are knocked off. It's so great. Um, But then I play it and I'm like, that is so great. It's such a good game. It, It reminds me a little bit of, how I feel about Shakespeare too. Like Shakespeare, I don't remember it as well as it really is. Like I was like going through my top 10 list and I was like, Shakespeare made eight. What the heck? And I was like, Oh yeah, that game is pretty awesome. And this one's in that same category and just like surprisingly awesome. Every time I play it, just such a great dice placement game. Um, it just, it's the definitive dice placement game. I would say at this point still. So, um, voyages of Marco Polo, just super good. And like, if you're like me and you're like, Hey, that, that dude's got a very, interesting face and there's a lot of yellow on this box like try and ignore that and actually play it in spite of that because it's it's seriously awesome i'm not going to say much but yeah voyages of marco polo is a good game jason your silence is interesting (laughs) anyway uh (laughs) what was your number four game jason (laughs) my number four is a game about mayans and a calendar and it's called zolkin so this is a worker placement game where you're placing these little cylinder guys that you have out on these gears and the gears are going to pass after every round to simulate like time, you know, months or weeks or whatever. And then the worker is going to go move to a more powerful location. So on your turn, you either have to put guys on the gears or you have to pull guys off. You can't do both. So you can't put some on and pull some off. So you're trying to put guys on the lowest gear and then sometimes you have to wait. So you always have to keep one guy available, ready to go. So you can get these other people to get where you need to go. You're trying to collect crystal skulls. You're trying to collect corn. You're moving up tracks. I love tracks. You're collecting resources to buy buildings. Just a really fun game. It it does. I mean, honestly, I don't think it's like outside of the, the gears and the passing of time. It's a standard worker placement game. But the gears puts a whole new twist. It's kind of gimmicky. But without those gears, that game would be... It wouldn't even be in the top thousand. I don't think it would be good at all without those gears. So Zolkin is my number four. Yeah, I need to play this one again. I don't have a whole lot to say about it. And it's not because I might talk about it later. Or is it? But no, I haven't played this game in a very long time. And I don't remember it very well. Um, I remember liking it just fine, but not enough to say it's in my top ten games. I mean, if someone asked me to play Zolkin right now, I would say, yeah, let's do it. So um, it's certainly good. But... I just don't remember it enough. I just remember thinking, oh, I've got to plan ahead quite a bit on this gear boy here. Yep, you do. (laughs) Well, Jason, my number four is the game I was going to talk about because I just played it again this last weekend. And man, is it sweet. And that's Keyflower. Um, I'll tell you what I think is cool about it. If you, you can play it a ton of different ways. That's what's so cool about it. Um, It's an auction game that meets up with a... It's it's best friends with a with a worker placement game, so you can either use your workers to go do work on these tiles, or you can use your workers to, I guess I don't know, like hijack the place and move it to your village. So you're like auctioning them with your workers too, um, but it's got some really cool, interesting things that happen on it. So when you're you can play, there's these community tiles in the middle of the board, and you can place your workers on them to do the work that's happening there and get the benefit from it. But then if someone owns that tile and buys that tile in the auction later they get all those people that you place on that tile. The other kind of interesting thing too is there's this thing of you have to match the color that's on there. So if I used a yellow worker to go do work there, you have to bid with yellow workers then. And so there's ways you can kind of bully people by having like certain colors that you're making them burn up and then you use that same color like later to try and you know steal another tile cheap. Or another thing that happens, are there these green workers that aren't standard to the box? Like you can't draw them but you can transmute like another colored worker into a green worker. And like a lot of times people don't have green workers. So you can use these green workers to get things really cheap because you have to match colors again. And if no one has green workers, you can kind of steal things. 
Um, but the other cool thing too is then if you once you have these tiles in your own village, then you can put them to work in your own village, your workers, and then you get to bring them back. Plus, these boats come in with new workers all the time. So it's like your population of your village keeps going up. And I've played games of this where I have a ton, an absolute ton of workers that I can place in that last round. And it's it's really interesting, too. The gameplay in this game is always around an hour and a half, maybe an hour and a quarter to an hour and a half, depending on player count. And the first season you play it, you play with people and you're like, okay, so here's what you do. You go through it and you get done in like seriously five minutes. And people are like, how long is this game? You're like an hour and a half. We're going to do that three more times. And people are like, there's no way this is going to last an hour and a half. But then it always lasts an hour and a half because as you get more and more stuff, you just have such harder decisions to make. And there's so many more things you can do with your workers. And just it builds so well. It's an awesome just building over throughout the whole game. The other thing, too, is I think everything in that game um, is very much there by design. And not nothing's there to be like an extra bell and whistle. Like everything in that game is kind of critical to it being balanced and working as well as it does together. So that's Keyflower. And I look forward to playing this one with you soon, Jason. Oh, yeah, I've never played it. I haven't played any of the key games, so I need to get at least this one under my belt because this is like the the Mac Daddy of them all. So I'd like to play this one. Yeah, I think it's really good. All right, so moving on from auctioning and stealing people's land, we're going to go to, I don't even know what country they're from, so I'm not going to talk anymore and sound stupid. I'm just going to talk about my number three, and that is Lorenzo Il Magnifico. I'm guessing Italy? Yeah, I think think they're Italian. Um, But Lorenzo is essentially, it's a dice placement game, but your dice are represented by these little pillars. The dice are on the board, so everybody shares the numbers of the dice. And you have pillars that represent the orange, white, and black die. And then you have this idiot like family member that's a zero that you have to send along servants and you know influential people to make so he can do anything. And you're trying to collect cards to build some engines. You're collecting cards to score in-game points. You're trying to get these territories so you can run this machine that just gives you piles of points and goods. And you're all also trying to ensure that you keep the the priest or the Catholic church happy so they don't slap you around at the end of every two rounds. So Lorenzo a Magnifico, great game. A really tight worker placement game, and that's my number three. Yeah, it's a good game. Uh, you introduced me to this one. I've only played it the one time. Um, I think I understood it like a minute from the end and I was like, oh, the machines, that's how you get them to run. Cool. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that's pretty important. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think it's cool. I think it's definitely a good game if people haven't had a chance to play it. They should. So my next three games, Jason, I think are all games that you're going to be like, yeah, those are great games, but you might argue they're not worker placement games. I don't know. We'll see. Um, this one's more of a worker movement game. I consider this, I consider this one. So yeah, I would agree with you. Uh, and that's Vino's. Um, I just really love this game. Uh, it's a good game. It feels like you're actually running a business. Like that's such a cool feeling to feel like I'm making business decisions to make something really cool. And, and then you're trying to design and craft a wine that you're really proud of. And then you, um, take it to a a fair where snooty people on snooty cardboard turn their nose up at your wine and make you feel like you didn't do very well. (laughs) Yes. So I don't know. It's a good game, though. I really like it, and it's t- <laughs> it's it's what most people consider a heavy game. Um, but I think Jason considers it family plus, and I would say it's just north of medium now. Like I honestly feel that way. Like I don't know. I think I think I don't know. Like again, I don't know how we define what heavy is. Is it the number of rules? Is it the number of decisions? How difficult the decisions are? But I think this is one that after you play it a few times, you're like. It's not that hard. There's nine things that can happen, and then they trigger another 95 things that could happen. So, right. I mean, I don't uh, know. Yeah. It's it's a good game, though. Yeah, I like that's my thing with a lot of Vitals games is the first time you play them, they seem like they're impossible. But then the more you become familiar with the engine and the mechanisms, it's like, oh, yeah, I get, I understand this. I, I know what I need to do here. Like, And it's so streamlined and so simple once you actually have played it and understand it. But, yeah, Vinos is a good pick for sure. I don't necessarily know if it is worker placement, but you are taking a worker and placing it in different areas. So to me, it counts. So Jason, this has got me just thinking here because I'm trying to think where this one's going to pop up on your top 100 games of all time. Um, And I'm thinking about that right now. And I'm thinking our password for this week, if you made it to this point in the episode, is going to be just do a hashtag top 100. and, And then you tell us the month you want us to do it in. Because I think that'd be kind of fun to see when people think we should do it. Because I know a lot of people bring oh, yeah. theirs out in December, or people do their top, you know, like of the year in December, and then they do their top 100 of all time in November. 
which if that's the case, we got to get going on that probably. Um, <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> but at any rate, the password for this month is uh, for this for this is top one hundred in. Then you pick a month and don't. September is disqualified. It it doesn't get to. <laughs> It, it's right. been a bad month. It doesn't get to uh, do it. And then October <laughs> as well. Like I think October is probably disqualified as well. So I, I, yeah, I, I don't yeah. want to wait for 12 months and I don't want to do it yet this month. So um, <laughs> anyway, and yeah, I mean, ideally something yet in 2018, but anyway, hashtag when you want us to do it, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I it makes sense to me. And I'm sure if we have, if anybody has any questions, they'll let us know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, I'm, I hate to be so crazy this episode or whatever, but I, I don't know, man. We got called amazing this week. So I feel like there's a banner we've got to carry. So it's a lot of pressure, that's Jason. True. We got to be amazing. So <laughs> that's true. You know, I think we're trying our best. We'll see. We'll see. And also, um, to those of you who think there's a like a, a alternate reality game inside these that we have hidden codes and stuff, we absolutely 100% do. And there were just like seven hidden messages. In that thing I just said, where I was stammering and like stu- like st- like stumbling over my words, there were like seven hidden yeah. messages in there. Just if, see if you can find them, and then if you get to the secret website, just message me and you'll get your prize. <laughs> but don't be disappointed by the surprise. Or if you get a four hundred four error when you get to the website you think exists, maybe. <laughs> yeah. All right. So my number two. No surprise, it's one you've mentioned before, and that is Voyages of Marco Polo. Uh, this game is probably the best dice placement game that I've played. It has the mechanism where you have to place more than one die sometimes, but the action triggers off the lowest die that you put out there. So you can put a six, a five, and a one, but your action has the power of a one. And you have to pay taxes if you go on top of somebody else's dice, which is also a pretty cool mechanism that's not always in games where you can go where somebody else is, but you have to pay money for it. And just moving around the board is so awesome. And it's always tight on money. You always want to do like five more actions than you're allowed to do. This is, this game's incredible. I mean, you already talked about it. I'm not going to beat the the dead horse. So Voyages of Marco Polo, even without the expansion, my number two. And I, I saved this for when you were going to talk about it. I'm going to pretend like that's real. And I didn't just think of it just now. Um, <laughs> the other thing that this game does as well as any other game, is if you look up asymmetrical player powers in the dictionary, this guy pops oh, up because yeah. it just does the best job. Like every character, you're like, this this guy breaks the game. Like how like how are you allowed to play with him? Like Marco Polo <laughs> yeah. has literally like another die. Like how is that even fair? And then you're like, oh, I get it. It's fair because this guy literally gets goods every time anyone buys any goods. And I mean, just there's some crazy powers in that game. Yeah, like you have that guy where you can put any die down at any number that you want, so you don't even have to roll. Right. Like it's nuts. Like every time you play this game, it's like, man, how how is this not? How am I not creaming everyone? Because everyone else has a power that's thinking, how am I not creaming everyone? Right. It's yeah, it's it's amazing. And I don't think this is quite how it works, but I remember it like being exhausting and grueling to try and travel to like set up settlements on that game, and. And then, like, there's one guy whose power is like, oh, yeah, I just can go wherever I want at any time, practically. I mean, like... Yeah, he can, like, teleport. And then there's the one guy that every time he runs through a city, he can drop a house behind right. him. So he, he can put, like, eight houses down on a turn if he gets a good, like, movement. He's, like, the, yeah. the most fertile man or something. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah. something. Yeah, it's crazy. It It's really good game, though. Voyages of Marco Polo. Everybody should try that if you haven't. Good game. Absolutely. I agree. Just a two less than you. Um, three less than you. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my number two is it's surprising that it hasn't popped up on Jason's list yet. I don't know if this one would be higher for you now or not, but I guess it was your number six. It was my number six, yeah. Viticulture with the Essential Edition and or Tuscany. I think that's kind of a critical part of it, too. Um, yeah. This is one that was kind of really completed by having that expansion put in there. But this is just, I mean, like, I don't know that I love this game at, like, a number two spot um, necessarily. But to me, if you're going to say this is the game that is worker placement to a person who's not played worker placement much or is ready for that next step after Lords of Waterdeep or something, this is the next game, I think. And it's got luck in it. Those cards are very much, you can get lucky with those cards or have bad luck with those cards. But I think games need to have luck in them. I think games are more fun when there's some luck in there. So... 
I don't even mind that, but Viticulture is my number two. I really love this game. I think it just plays so well. And this one is the best. I, I think I've said it before, and I'm going to stick with it. It's my favorite solo board game. I just think that all the campaign stuff in there that you can get through and some of those scenarios you can get through with the solo plays are just brutally hard and just really good puzzles to try and solve on your own. So Viticulture, I recommend for anybody, but also for people who uh, have to play board games with their pets because their pets are their best board gaming companions. And that's me. Um, and they aren't very good at board gaming. So you play solo. Yeah. If, if I would have done this list again, Viticulture would probably be higher than it was, but I will say this is the most played game that I've played this year, according to my, my board game tracker. So I love this game. I play a solo all the time and yeah, it's number six for me, three or six. I mean, still it's in a top 10. It's still amazing. So Totally agree. Well, and the other thing, too, is it's so played probably because it's so accessible. I mean, like, this is something that you can play with about any group. Right. That's Except true. Except for the church people because they don't like wine. But <laughs> as you can see, I'm a, I'm a church boy and I love beer and wine based on the four games out of ten that are alcohol-based. <laughs> That's not true. I mean, churches do like wine. Yeah. Our boy, G our boy Jesus drank some wine. So here's your theology lesson. This is a bonus, guys. <laughs> Jesus turns water into wine, right? But he does it after people are already drunk. So, like, if Jesus isn't down with people getting drunk at weddings, why did he make wine for drunk people? Tell, ask your deacon that. Ask your elder that. Yeah. Hashtag theology 101. Hashtag that's the real password. <laughs> yeah. All right. Moving on from theology to some more theology by Vital Lacerda himself. Um, my number one game is, well, it was my number one game the last time I did my top 100. I'm not going to say that that's the same. It may be, it may not be, but my number one game for this list, the worker placement list is the gallerist. Uh, and it, it still is essentially a worker movement thing because you're moving from one space to one of the other four, but you are picking up the guy and placing it on the spot. So to me, it counts. Um, the gallerist, you are in charge of running a gallery. You're trying to get paintings, discover artists. Um, you're trying to get VIPs and investors to come into your gallery so you can score points or fame and money. You're trying to sell paintings. You're trying to get paintings at the auction. You're trying to mingle with the foreign market dignitaries so you can have the best kind of um, gallery that you can get. It's a great game. Like every Vital game, Vital game, you're always going to need to have more stuff than you can get. But if you get a chance to play the gallerist, don't be intimidated by the way it looks. It's pretty simple once you grok it, and it's just moving guy down around, taking the actions. And the gallerist is my number one. Check it out. Yeah, um, I think honestly, I think you and I might not have had our top ten games in this because we didn't want to each have like two or three Vital sort of games in it. Because I've not played gallerist much, but I really like it too. I mean, like it could arguably be in my top ten games. I and that's even with me totally not understanding at all how the foreign market works or whatever it's called on the side. There. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's a great game for sure. My number one, Jason, isn't even a worker placement game. I mean, honestly, it's not. I don't know. It is, but I love this game so much. <laughs> I mean, it kind of is, but kind of not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great Western Trail. I've never loved a game more that you were more mediocre on ever in my life. Um, I, I just love this game. I think the more I play it, the more I love it. It just, it's a great game to me. It's got just so many cool mechanisms that go together. It's got the moving your guys and placing them onto your built settlements. And then it's got your building settlements. It's got like, kind of like, uh, I don't know. It's got like a race element to it. It's got deck building to it. It's got like set, com set collection, kind of like task completion kind of things to it too that train it's just got so many cool things to it but there's definitely a worker placement element to it or worker movement i guess but you're picking where your guy's gonna go and then he gets an act gets to do work based on you know where he's at so um i'm gonna call it worker placement just barely but i love this game so much that it puts puts it at my number one spot and oh boy um i'm working on my top 100 and again what month do you want that in but this one's gonna be really high i mean i mean really high for me um, so we'll see where it ends up at, but I really love this game. Um, so anyway, it's always hard to make a top 10 list, Jason. What didn't quite make your list? Well, I had a few that, well, I have to delete one cause I screwed up, but we'll ignore that one. I have a few that I wanted to add to my list, but again, you can only have 10. So 
I want to just mention a couple here. I think Trakirian is a great worker placement game. It has cool mechanisms with workers having different powers and being able to take different strengths of actions. Uh, Vasco da Gama, I know you love that game. It has the cool mechanism where you're sending workers out with different numbers. So you might be the first person to place, but you could take the last uh, number so to have your player activate. Uh, I think Istanbul is an interesting take on twist on worker placement. It's essentially worker movement, I guess. But again, you're picking up the dude and moving it around. Uh, Demon Worker, you haven't played that yet, but it is worker placement. You're taking your workers and you're putting them on a location and taking the action. I love that game. It's It probably is going to be pretty high on my top 100 list. It's that good. And my last one I wanted to mention is Rajas of the Ganges, which is a worker placement and dice kind of place mini game yeah that came out this year that's really good so those are my a few honorable mentions for me i was just drooling over tracarion early this morning i was just like getting my wish list ready for my mom for christmas which i talk about in here a lot but honestly like if my mom doesn't know exactly what to buy me i end up with like one time she bought me this board game called pirate king not, not even kidding so um i try and make it very easy on her <laughs> So <laughs> she loves buying me presents. I mean, it's her love language to me is to buy me a couple board games at Christmas time. But Tricarion right. was really high on the list of things that I was like, man, I really want that. But it's kind of hard to get right now. Um, you can get it, it straight from the publisher, but um, I don't know. It's It looks pretty sweet, though. And then Rajas of the Ganges, I'm going to say it along with one that's kind of an honorable mention for me, um, Rise to Nobility, are great, great games, but it's like, if you could be a, you could be a really really amazing like artist, but if you live in the era of like Leonardo da Vinci, you're like you're always second best. You know what I mean? So it's like right, yeah. With yeah, Marco yeah. Polo being out, it's really hard for those games to get a fair crack at being as awesome as they should be. So, um, Rising Ability is is a good game though. Um, so my honorable mentions, Jason, um, Near and Far. That one's I think a, a worker placement game in my opinion. I like it quite a bit. Um. I like Lahav a lot. That one didn't quite make my list, I don't think. Um, no, nope, that, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, the Manhattan Project, that was my go-to worker placement game at one point. Um, yeah. Uh, Kingsburg, that's actually a really good game. And I think you kind of could call it dice placement. Um, I don't know. That's, that's yeah. a stretch a little bit, I guess. Um, I really enjoy that one too, though. And then, and then uh, I'm going to finish it off with a little bit of some alchemists. Um, that one's pretty great too. And it's got kind of a cool thing where you can go to a place after someone else goes there, but it's just going to cost you a little more. So, um, or you can go to a place a second time, I guess I should say, but it costs you kind of double. So, um, but it's got, that one was less known for its worker placement elements, but those are certainly there and more known for its puzzle elements. So, um, those are my honorable mentions. Really enjoy those games. And, uh, that's, that's it, buddy. I've got nothing else. I'm empty. Yep, I think we've uh, we did a successful uh, segment right there. So let's move on to the closing. Good job, Jason. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> hey, I want to just mention this real fast, and I think I can speak for Jason. He's right here. He'll speak for himself, I guess. But we had a record-setting week for, I think, YouTube views and podcast listens and downloads. Uh, this last week. So, man, that's awesome. It gets me pumped and makes me excited that we're doing what we're doing. So thank you guys for doing that. Um, we absolutely love, love, love that you guys are as engaged as you are and hooked in with us as you are. And then even on the Riveted, our, uh, our Facebook group, we started to see some new people posting over there. That was really cool. Um, loving to just interact with you guys. Uh, and I promise, like, I know you guys probably think Jason's this rich and famous guy, but, um, he will talk to you on Facebook. He's really approachable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm more than just a voice behind a microphone. <laughs> Who's seeking rich and glory, riches and glory. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it, back to the YouTube thing. It is nice to actually get comments from people other than Picorni too. So we actually started getting that this week, which was nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we love Picorni, but I mean, it's nice to see other people's names too. Yeah, I don't think we're understood abroad yet. I remember when I did Dad's in the game videos, and like thirty percent of the views were in Sweden. Um, ours are not like they're like ninety six percent U.S., four percent Canada. Like, so <laughs> yeah. 
But yeah. if you're if you're so that's the real like highest five. If you're from overseas, if you're from anywhere but North America and you're listening to this or you've watched our YouTube videos, man, you you've got to go to the riveted.com, join our group and just talk to us and say, Hey, I'm from Luxembourg and I love the board game boys. Um anyway. Maybe they should be from Lancashire or yeah, Lancashire or Birmingham. That would be cool. Oh, that would be cool. Jason, you just ruined my number one game of all time. Great. Now no one's going to listen to my top 100 games. <laughs> I did it. No one would have even known. I was just making a brass joke. <laughs> I don't think it is my number one, though. Man, it's dang good, though. All right. Yeah. Well, I've been Joel. And I'm Jason. And I'm going to stop recording. I don't care how much longer you go on, Jason. I mean, if you want to read, I don't know, The Great Gatsby to them or whatever, go ahead. But I'm done for tonight. So peace out, guys. Yeah, I don't know if people get us or not, but we have a lot of fun doing this. <laughs> yeah, they'll figure it out. I mean, they should know by now that it's ridiculous, but whatever. I mean, the people who get us, like, get us. Like, and they really <laughs> like us. Because we're, we're kind of our own thing, you know? I mean, like, we're just <laughs> stupid, silly, whatever. I mean, like, I don't know. We're the most alternative comedy pod, board game podcast out there there is. <laughs> right.